So there's actually quite a lot that I got to unpack uh, in this particular video. With, uh, if it drags on too long, because I've got so many information, I've got so much information from uh, a couple of different sources that if, it, if I, I can't fit it all into this one video, I might have to actually split it in two. I uh, got a, quite a number of screens here open uh, because I got to do a whole lot of jumping back and forth with, with various uh, information and new information just rolled in today about it. But what this is concerning, it's concerning a, a 2020 uh, study from Cochrane uh, saying that Alcoholics Anonymous is more successful than any other program uh, when it comes to alcohol treatment. That, uh, you know, even psychotherapy doesn't hold a candle to the success rate of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. Which I guess means that I should uh, turn this channel off and uh, black it out and delete all my videos and ride off into the sunset because science has proven that AA works better than any other treatment method there is on the planet, uh, but not so fast. But one thing, uh, before I dive into all of this, because I'm not even sure which place I want to start with on this, first... Uh, there was a, a saying that's been attributed to uh, Mark Twain, who I did look it up to verify, and he actually did say it. He claims it came from uh, British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, although there's no evidence that he actually said it. But he said uh, there were three types of lies. There were lies, there were damned lies, and then there's statistics uh, in, refer in reference to the numbers game that uh, people play with a lot of statistics and a lot the way that... Statistics and numbers can be manipulated to show whatever kind of outcome you really want them to be. Now, I'm not saying that this audit, that this Cochrane study that I'm going to be uh, talking about in this video is just, you know, totally fake and there's nothing to it whatsoever. So, therefore, everything I don't like is fake and made up. I don't want to come at, I don't want to approach the subject from that angle. Uh, but I do want to talk about. Uh, something, and I'll, I'll even post the links to some scientific journals and scientific articles that talk about this, is that in the academic or quackademic world, if you want to call it that, that, that's how I got the title of this channel, by the way. There was a guy that was always referring to academia as quackademia, and uh, that's where I came up with the, with the name for this, uh, for this channel. So anyway, there is a, a pressure in the scientific community uh, by and large, and I'm talking about the actual scientific community. These are reputable articles I'm posting here. This isn't some some guy on YouTube that's just saying, you know, science is being faked and manipulated to some grand conspiracy all over the place to do this, that, and the other. You know, and I'm proving it because I've, I've got some uh, article from a conspiracy theory webpage that's on the dark web somewhere that tells the truth about the whole thing. That's not the angle I'm coming at here, uh, just to get that out of the way and to clear that up. Uh, but there is a pressure in the scientific world of, among it, the academics, the scientists, to uh, exist in this culture that they call publish or perish. And literally what that means is that you have immense pressure on top of you every year. Or in this case, there's some uh, aspects of this Cochrane study that can immediately be called into question, but I'll get to that in a minute. But that you're kind of pressured to publish so many periodicals per year. In fact, I even remember 60 Minutes talking about this because there were certain university professors that said they weren't allowed as much time to do their job in terms of teaching and being in the classroom uh, with their students and because of all this pressure to put out all these periodicals and journals. It's literally publish or perish, meaning if you don't publish all the stuff that you could face not getting tenure renewed or you could lose funding, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and that oftentimes, one fatal flaw in a publish or perish uh, culture that these scientists were talking about is a lot of the times statistics, they're kind of made up out of thin air. They may not be completely fake, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a study here that shows this, that, you know, in the other point A, point B, and just totally make up a, a completely new scientific term or make up a completely new scientific fact that doesn't exist. It's not what I'm, I'm, I'm driving at. What I'm saying is, you can, if you're publishing a paper that's favorable towards this study or that study, uh, there is sometimes, due to the immense pressure, to add on information that's not really there. I don't know if anybody on here has ever written a college paper or something like that, or if you read a, a term paper, you have all these MLA citations, ALA citations, and references and indexes, and all that other kind of thing. But if you wanted to write an article, for instance, about the dangers of cigarette smoke, 
and you were in a pressure to put out so many periodicals per year, it, it might be a little tempting to say, well, I don't have time for all this MLA shit in my 70-hour work week. So let me just put this thing in here. 57% of people uh, who smoked more than three packs of cigarettes a day said they developed... Uh, lung ailments, it, it would sound very believable, it might be somewhere in a ballpark figure, but there's no basis in scientific reality about this. The Cochrane Review has done this before, uh, there's a little information about the Cochrane Review that uh, I, I might have to go back in depth and do another video on this because I don't have that information in front of me right now, but they did a similar study a few years ago, you know, AA works better than any other treatment method, you know, it's the best treatment method out there. Now, of course, off the top of my head, I would say that AA is the, 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 the cult religion of AA is what 99% of the population is exposed to if you end up in any kind of legal hot water or if you end up in any kind of situation involving like the $35 billion a year treatment center industry uh, is predominantly AA. You don't have, I, I guarantee you, and I've said it in other videos before, if you grab the average guy off the street and you say to him, hey, I got a friend of mine, he's got a drinking problem, and he's really drinking pretty heavy, what do you think I should do with him? They're probably going to tell you, without any knowledge, even if they don't have any experience uh, in it, they're going to say, well, you know, have you thought about getting in touch with an AA meeting or, you know, something like that? Or, of course, they'll do that or they'll either talk about tough love, too, to boot. Well, the first thing you got to do, you got to... You got to be tough. You got to cut him off financially. You got to make sure he's living on the streets under a bridge somewhere and, and pouring down rain in the middle of wintertime because you got to do that to, uh, to these drug addicts and alcoholics and they'll never get better. Uh, but you need to look up AA too. Because that kind of thinking is so ingrained in our culture, so ingrained in, in everything that you see from films to books to TV, so much for the anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films, that people are literally kind of programmed to think that that's the way you're supposed to do those things, in spite of the mountains of evidence that say otherwise. However, that was going to be my first, without looking into it a little bit heavier, that was going to be my first problem. With it. Well, more people are exposed to AA than any other people. You grab somebody off the street and you say, have you ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? They're going to say, sure, yeah. You know, uh, just like that show I was watching, you know, where the main character is in AA or something like that. You ask somebody on the street, you ever heard of Rational Recovery? You ever heard of Smart Recovery? You ever heard of Harm Reduction? Have you ever heard of Hames? Have you ever heard of those? They're probably not going to know what those are about. Have you ever heard of uh, uh, the Sinclair Method? Probably not going to know about it. Now, believe it or not, I was in AA over a decade, and I never heard about any other alternatives to treating alcoholism in that entire decade, a little bit over a decade. The entire time I was in AA, I literally thought that AA was the only treatment center, uh, treatments, not treatment center, but treatment option out there available. I didn't even know there was any other alternatives. You know, you get court ordered into into 12 step groups like I did when I was in drug court five years after I had been in AA. Uh, you go to a treatment center, it's AA. Uh, you go to a therapist about a marital problem and say, I'm drinking too much. I'll tell you to go to AA. So AA is pretty much inundated everywhere. Everywhere you see, it's a mass inundation. It's a meta narrative to rip off the postmodernist. But the, this Cochrane study, uh, I've got like four or five tabs open here. Uh, so I'm going to start probably uh, with the actual study itself that was a publication in the News Center. Uh, Stanford researcher, by the way, it's a Stanford researcher that believes in taking away people's choice in addiction treatment in Alberta, Canada. Somebody online uh, in a group that I'm involved with actually put that article out today, which kind of changes the whole entire effect of this particular study. The person behind the study is pushing really hard for people to be forced into 12-step programs in Canada. So there's a bias here already. As a matter of fact, there's another article I could publish. I, I, if you look at my video description today, you're going to see about 9 or 10 different freaking links to click on. It might keep you busy for the whole entire weekend if you got any free time or if you're not working this weekend. But there's an implicit bias with these Cochrane reviews. They're considered the gold standard, the gold seal of everything. But there is a couple of articles saying that when the people doing the research are biased, then you're not looking for accurate information. You know, if you got somebody uh, who works in the paper industry, who makes a fortune in paper, 
uh, in the paper industry, of course, he's going to launch a study and say, you know what? There's no danger in deforestation. There's no danger in slicing down forest everywhere. We're, we're planting 20 billion trees for every 100,000 trees we cut out. Of course, there's no danger in deforestation. Of course, there's no harm to the environment. He's going to say that because his interests are vested in the paper industry. Even though I think some portions of the paper industry is actually invested in, uh, you know, uh, what, what's what? Not just the recyclable material. There's an official word for it, but I can't think of it. But you get the point I'm making here. So if you got one of the guys, the Stanford researchers, who's pro 12 step, who says in another article in Canada where he wants to rob people's choices about whether they want to go to treatment or not, he claims, well, you know, if we give people choices, we won't be able to save their lives because they won't choose to go to treatment. In other words, uh, if you don't, if you have a choice, join the AA cult religion. But well, don't join the AA cult religion. That, that's, that's bad for you because I'm trying to save your life and you're too stupid to understand what's best for you. So I got to take that choice away from you. So keep that in mind when it comes to this particular uh, study. But it says a Stanford researcher and two collaborators conducted an extensive review of Alcoholics Anonymous and found that hello, the fellowship, fellowship <laughs> helps more people achieve sobriety than therapy does. That's a grand sweeping claim. Okay, it's not probably rooted in any basic fact whatsoever, but we're going to continue with this horseshit claim. Uh, I don't know if anybody on here knows about Christopher Hitchens, <clears throat> but he, he was famous for saying, he, he, some of his books are really, really interesting reads, but he said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. He was talking about religion. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this because it says, you know, it's just more advertisement. Oh, oh my phone actually went out. <laughs> hold on a second it's more advertisement for the actual cult religion itself because it's talking about how you know wonderful it is how long it's been around and all that but it says after evaluating 35 studies involving the work of 145 scientists and the outcomes of 10,000 participants Keith Humphreys don't forget the name Keith Humphreys he's the one that wants to take away your right to choice in Canada in Alberta you don't get a you don't get a say so we can mandate you in the 12-step treatment programs against your will in Alberta, Canada, if this guy has his way about it. So take what he's saying with a grain of salt. Uh, his fellow investigators determined AA was nearly always found to be more effective than psychotherapy in achieving abstinence. That's bullshit. I don't even need to dive into some of my evidence here to tell you right off the bat. That is complete and utter bullshit. Uh... And it goes on about the history of the review when it says, although AA is well known and used by millions around the world, mental health professionals are sometimes skeptical of its effectiveness. Humphrey said psychologists and psychiatrists trained to provide cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational enhancement therapy to treat patients can have a hard time admitting that the lay people who run AA groups do a better job of keeping people on the wagon. That is a bald-faced fucking lie. Okay, it, this sounds too much like a cult apologist to me. You've got to remember, Mr. Humphreys here wants to take away your right to go to treatment or not in Canada. So I'm going to take this with a grain of salt. But of course, they give the history of AA. And of course, they're going to give you the thing about how the study shines. And of course, by the time it's all over with, we might as, all, we might as well all pack up our mental health items, everything you thought you knew about therapy, everything you knew about CBT, everything you knew about rational, emotive, behavioral therapy, and just throw it all in the garbage because AA is just better than everybody, right? But not so fast. Thanks to uh, Mr. Uh, Stanton Peel, I got to give him a special thanks for doing this, uh, has an article about this. So Alcoholics Anonymous has proven the work after all. Not so fast. Alcoholics Anonymous in its 12 steps with their prescription of abstinence have dominated America's response to addiction for over a half a century. Yet despite all the urges of the advocates, the lucrative 12-step based rehab industry to enshrine the status, reliable studies demonstrating AA's effectiveness were not ever forthcoming. In 2006, this is the first Cochrane study, uh, a review of controlled AA research, eight studies, 3,500 subjects, by the prestigious Cochrane Group found that no experimental studies unequivoc unequivocally demonstrated the effectiveness of AA for reducing alcohol dependence of problems. Now, of course, Cochrane has revisited this question. This is a study. This is a study I'm talking about. Uh, with 10,565 subjects, 
it announced its findings on March the 11th. And you know that it's, it's horrible this shit gets published. Because can't you just see a bunch of fucking asshole old-timers in AA meetings saying, Well, here it is. Science proves we're the best one ever. So, you know, go out there and drink yourself to death if you think you're so fucking smart. The program's the only way out. And, and this kind of shit. You know, it's funny. Fucking AA assholes are always accusing me of killing people. You know, you, you, you're talking bad about AA is killing alcoholics. When they're probably going to use the same kind of shit to force their religious horseshit down people's throats and no doubt destroy more people because more people are going to say, well, the verdict is in, the science is in, the 12 steps rule. But I'm going to go on here. The authors, it just makes me so angry. I just had to put that in there. The authors found high certainty evidence that clinically delivered and manualized 12-step facilitation can lead to higher rates of continuous abstinence over months or years when compared to active treatment approaches such as cognitive behavioral therapy. This was news the world wanted to hear, P, uh, Stanton Peel writes. New study shows how effective AA really is was splashed all over USA Today, much to the delight of every sadistic fucking religious asshole old-timer that uses those uh, rooms to as a playground to bully and manipulate gaslight people. You know, it's just a shame that this kind of shit gets out into the mainstream culture. I can't help but get pretty pissed off about that. But anyway, we'll, keep, we'll continue to the real evidence here because that's what I want. So should those of us who have opposed the large-scale imposition of AA now all throw our hands up and apologize? Well, let's talk about this. This is Peel writing, Stanton Peel. The authors of the Cochrane Review are John Kelly of Harvard Medical School, Keith Humphreys of Stanford University. Uh, that's the Keith Humphreys that wants to take away your right to uh, treatment center choice in Canada. Uh, America Ferry, I think I said that, of the European, I don't know how to spell that, say that correctly, I'm sorry. Uh, for the Drugs and Drug Addiction European Center, Kelly, the most outspoken of the group, publicly advocates for the brain disease model. And by the way, stay tuned. It, 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 may, it may not be next week's video, but very soon I got a, an entire video lined up about why this brain disease model is horse shit. So already we've got bias here. You got Keith Humphreys that wants everybody court-ordered into, into treatment against their fucking will, violating their constitutional rights, and you've got an outspoken lady that says that alcohol is a brain disease, which, by the way, I've got a lot of evidence to prove is bullshit, but I can't do it in this video because I'm already 17 minutes in. Whoa. I, I don't remember who it was that said something about demagoguery, and, and uh, well, I can't remember the exact quote, but what I was going to say is, uh, when somebody makes an outrageous statement and it takes pages and pages to disapprove of it, uh, it's one of these tactics, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a tactic that these quackaholic people use. AA, as you may be aware, is not a harm reduction operation, Stanton Peel writes. So Kelly and Humphreys, Cochrane's reported results, unlike the prior review, laser focused on abstinence only, comparing abstinence outcomes with those of other clinical interventions over varied periods of time. Their touted positive finding is that 8A improves rates of continuous abstinence at 12, 24, and 36 months, with a 7 percentage point advantage at one year. However, I love the however, the caveats that, uh, because you can, any, anybody can make grand sweeping claims with some fancy fucking numbers, right? This announced positive result was compared with the first review was due solely to switching measurements from actual recovery rates to continuous abstinence. In other words, Cochrane also downplayed negative findings. People who participate and continue in AA programs may be more likely to continue to abstain in the very early years than those in other programs. There are far-reaching problems with the self-selecting population that were studied, as we shall soon see in this article. I told you, this is going to be a longer video. <laughs> But let's turn first to these results pre presented by Cochrane. i got to give a big shout-out to Stanton Peel here. Uh, if uh, you do see this video by any chance, don't sue me for copyright infringement or something. I'll put a link to your article uh, in the video description. But I do want to say thumbs up for doing this because a lot of scientific uh, findings like this are never called into question. You know, the, the guys like Lance Dodes and Stanton Peel and the other pioneers in the frontiers of uh, challenging this entire brain disease AA meta-narrative, you know, Got to put it, got to give you a thumbs up for that because it's risky when you're uh, embarking on that. In fact, I had something I wanted to say about science, but for the interest of time, I'll keep going. Taken overall, the multitude of measures and periods over which subjects were observed offer a lot to pick and choose from in claiming that AA is potentially beneficial. 
Such benefits are not apparent across the board. And the reverse was often the case. Got to say it again. The reverse was often the case. Got to hold this phone away. I got to light up there like I'm some kid in the dark. Uh, people in other interventions, in other interventions now, remember they just said that AA worked better than any other program, even better than psychotherapy, and outshined it all, right? Not so fast. People in other interventions racked up on average just as many total abstinent days. The reverse of what they were claiming was often the case. AA, as Cochran found, did not show, did not show a difference in percentage of days abstinence with non-12-step approaches at 12 months. This means the people in AA were more likely to have experienced unbroken abstinence over a 12-month period, but people in other interventions which display less abhorrence of some level of drinking racked up on average just as many total abstinence uh, abstinent days. Get to tripping all over my words here when I get carried away like that. Uh, the review did show AA did better at 24 months and 36 months for this measure, but only with two and one studies respectively. In both cases, this was rated very low certainty evidence. I got to say it again, very low certainty evidence. I just almost have to say these things twice because I feel like I'm punching back at the fucking 12-step monolith when I say that. The review also reported for the longest period of abstinence, AA may perform as well as comparison interventions at six months on low certainty evidence, but not for longer periods. This is puzzling. So unlike continuous abstinence, longest periods of abstinence advantages uh, did not appear in the AA studies instantly, and AA was maybe only just as good as other interventions in that regard. 12-step programs apparently did not produce equally longest periods of abstinence afterwards. This is an extremely problematic finding, a uh, problematic finding, Dr. Peel says. Why did reports on this study not notice this result? I'll tell you why. Because there were lies, there were damn lies, and there are statistics. The same apparent disadvantage for AA was true in regards to drinking intensity. For drinking intensity, it said AA may perform as well as other clinical interventions at 12 months as measured by drinks per drinking day and percentage of days heavy drinking, my emphasis, but for no longer period. In other words, AA programs struggled to keep participants from not drinking more intensively than non-12-step AA groups. This is the antithesis of a benefit. AA groups, by convincing people they can't control their drinking, make it likelier that when such subjects do drink, they do so explosively. I need to find more studies about that because that's actually a proven thing. Uh, once again, commentaries have failed to note that this drawback to the Cochrane Research claim. Past research by Miller, I'm trying to swap around here because my signal is weird for some reason. <laughs> Past research by Miller, by uh, a couple other of these people, Humphreys, found treated subjects were more likely to relapse and to relapse far worse when they believed in the disease theory of alcoholism and the cultural delusion of one drink, one drunk. And he cites these very people involved in his study. Uh, keep in mind that per AA, no matter how long you've abstained, whether you take a single drink or have an all-out bender, you're back at day one. Non-12-step CBT programs, on the other hand, teach relapse prevention techniques, including a prevention a person's ability to get off the relapse train at any station. At any station, and I got to admit here, this is a, a low-down thing that I didn't even uh, realize when I started this video. I know I'm going on a little long here. They they had to, to switch the way they were studying the thing. They switched the thing to abstinence. You see, if you're in CBT, psychotherapy, smart recovery or any one of those methods, and you fail or fuck up, if you stop and you have a couple of beers one night, it's not considered really that big of a deal. Because in those methods of, of, of recovery, you're not really considered just a full-blown relapse. You know, your doctor, your professional, your group, or whatever it is, is likely to tell you something like, hey, you had a slip. It's not the end of the world. You don't have to get a white chip and start all over again and be browbeat by a bunch of old-timers. And it's talking about abstinence. They didn't talk about... In other words, they pulled a dirty little lowdown trick to manipulate their lies, damn lies, and statistics. Also, if you remember the video I did, I wonder how many of these people are actually telling the absolute truth. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association diagnoses substance abuse disorders not according to how many days people are abstinent, but by the real impacts on their lives. 
Let's just say, and this is something I forgot to bring up a point in in my last video. When I had that slip and I was so overcome with guilt and I was so overcome with remorse and misery and I was so ashamed of myself for not telling everybody the truth about that slip, the, tr the fact of the matter was I didn't look at myself and say, you know, you go on about 25, 35 days without drinking anything and you drank only a half pint. You didn't go out and get plastered and hammered on a half gallon, okay? You didn't really fuck up that bad. If you consider, if you were a daily drinker and drinking early in the morning like I was doing, and you went 25 days without drinking and you just had a tiny little slip, you didn't actually do anything really that bad, did you? Would you, would you, would you use the reasoning of I'm on a diet, I'm trying to use, I'm trying to lose 20 pounds, I fucked up last night and I had a piece of chocolate at the party, a piece of chocolate cake as well, I gotta go off the diet and just binge eat until I'm way more overweight now because I had a slip, of course you wouldn't. So this is another dirty underhanded tactic of theirs. Here again, Cochrane's pro-AA stance fails to hold for alcohol-related consequences, but for no longer period than 12 months. Isn't the, and I don't know what this word means, it's a Latin phrase, uh, of treatment ultimately beyond, ultimately people's functionality extending into the future beyond treatment or group participation. The result undercuts the entire AA good news story. For alcoholism severity, one study found evidence in favor of 12 months, Cochrane noted. But it's also the same study that the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism's massive studies conducted from 2001 to 2012 were, and remember, those are front groups for AA. That those with severe chronic alcohol addiction did not respond well to available AA-based treatment. This was the case in the Cochrane Review, aside from a single study for the 12-step advocates to claim to be the most helpful for the entire population. In terms of not reducing but exacerbating relapse, not improving overall life indicators, and not resolving severe alcohol addiction, the latest Cochrane results do not represent an actual change in any measured outcomes over the 2006 review. This ballyhoo over the new review is strictly nothing but public relations. Another caveat, Mr. Peel writes, is that widely ignores is that one of these major figures, Humphreys Kelly, and the others, best results occur with manualized TSF programs. That means extremely well-organized, competent treatment researchers and clinicians were involved in those programs. Detailed 12-step manuals for individual one-on-one -on -one therapy are not the standard for most rehabs and certainly not for any AA group. The template uh, for the results is legendary project match the most expensive clinical trial of alcohol use disorder treatment ever conducted which occupied eight years including detailed statistical analysis beginning in 1989 i am aware of the time i'm trying to move on a little bit here match's initial essential result was failure i'm going to say the word again because i get carried away by this failure the null hypothesis that there's no benefit to matching types of treatments with one of three treatments held that is, matching subject traits, treatments weren't an advantage. The entire approach has now been abandoned in the alcohol treatment field. But I guarantee you, the treatment center industry with a $35 billion a year industry, they're not turning down all the tax dollars and all the other money they built everybody for, even though they've abandoned certain uh, levels of research. As with the latest Cochrane Review, there were mild abstinence advantages, but the dominant overall result was general improvement for the subjects. However, it improved impossible to generalize any of these results. In the first place, there wasn't a no-treatment control group. Apparently, the researchers couldn't imagine natural recovery. In their review, the cost-related effect of other treatments, how does that compare with zero cost when you have controlled groups in the treatment field at the time? I'm going to skip a little bit more here because it's just going over what a failure project match was. I might could do another video on that. The positive Cochrane results are from controlled experimental comparisons of treatments of similarly cooperative subjects, and it doesn't discuss the subject composition over the multitude of studies. They thus are likely to find a function of the obedient, committed, socially well-situated good subjects who both participate in the studies and enroll in high-end, high-dollar rehabs and remain assiduous in their AA attendance. So yeah, if you ask 12 died in the wool cult members, you know, how does AA work for you? Oh, it works fine, it saved my life. You know, God sent me here, I know that. I know that for a fact. God sent me here. Of course it's gonna be favorable. Uh, in terms of lifetime recovery from alcohol dependence measured in the 43,000 subjects 
originally interviewed in the NESARC, uh, Americans who received treatment heavily weighted towards the 12 steps and abstinence were more likely to abstain. However, since they were also far less likely to try and achieve harm reduction outcomes, they were slightly more likely to maintain their abstinence. The studies reviewed that subjects who attend and remain in AA or voluntarily go to rehab, rehab are quite a small portion of the American population. Only a quarter of alcohol-dependent people are treated in any way, shape, form, or form. But even fewer, about half of these inner formal treatment are AA. How well do these subjects compare with all those facing addiction problems in the U.S.? In addition, here's another caveat. The studies reviewed did not include the large percentage of the population that's coerced into AA groups through drug courts, criminal courts, and family groups. They didn't study any of them. Cochrane's singular focus on 12-step programs for alcohol only and for control groups in treatment amplifies this gap, but poorer or less well-educated populations have far worse drug outcomes. Take one example that one of the states leading the nation in poverty, West Virginia, is in the lead in drug-related deaths. In 2017, the states with the highest rates of drug death or drug overdose were in West Virginia and Ohio, and the Commissioner of Public Health investigated every single death. And all of them concluded if you were male between the ages of 35 to 54 with less than a high school education, you're single and you worked in a blue collar industry and you would develop a problem with alcohol, you're pretty much at a very, very high risk of overdosing. overdosing. Were these deaths due to insufficient AA groups and 12-step treatment programs in West Virginia, as though there are many drug cores and treatment center programs available in both of these places? To summarize, we must greet these congratulatory headlines about AA and the 12 steps critically based on long-held predispositions of the researchers who are already biased in favor of it. In ideal settings with relatively privileged populations, AA increases the chance of a potential minor possibility of unbroken abstinence, but not of reductions of alcohol-related harms. Every th even taken at, ver at face value, the review is anything but the game-changing endorsement that the headlines and the researchers suggest. The same deficiencies appear in regards to severe relapses. Shockingly, a review said to indicate benefits for the 12 steps noted only keeping longest periods of sobriety before relapse, lower intensity of relapses on par with non-12-step treatments, but apparently could not achieve parity with the other treatments for longer periods. Is this really something to celebrate and scream and shout about as the popular press has been doing? And... Uh, I'm going to keep, uh, I've got so much more to uncover here that I realize I'm not going to be able to cover all this in this one video. So uh, I'm going to have to do a part one and a part two uh, uh, because I'm at 33 minutes already and I'm mainly primarily going from this article. The problem is uh, there is more that I want to touch on in this video than I can possibly do because there are other uh, sources that I want to weigh in on with it. So... I'm actually lucky today to have the afternoon off, so I might get part two of this up before the weekend is out. So I'll see you in part two of this video. And let me mark my place here as to where I left off, because it's not just Stan and Peel I want to I want to use source with. Uh, but I, I got to remember uh, where I left off here before I uh, shut it down, because look, there's just tons and tons of stuff here. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, I can turn the camera off. You don't need to see me scroll. <laughs> I'll see you in part two of the video. Later.